Depression is a debilitating yet largely misunderstood condition, and it's hard to understand what it really feels like without having experienced it yourself. A lot of people think that being depressed is the same thing as just being sad. These two words are often tossed around interchangeably, so it's understandable that people would think that they mean the same thing, even though they're very different. But because of this misconception, people with depression are constantly being told to snap out of it and to cheer up when it really doesn't work like that. Being depressed is a whole lot more than just being sad. Sadness is a very normal human emotion. We all get sad. Bad things happen in life. But usually after a certain amount of time has passed, we learn to accept and cope with what has happened and we make it out the other side. But for people with depression, you don't come out the other side. Things don't get better. You go down and you stay down. And there might not even be any clear reason as to why you went down in the first place. Depression is a whole lot more than just being sad. In fact, it's actually as much of a biological condition as diabetes, meaning that it's definitely not an all-in-your-head kind of thing. And by this logic, telling someone with depression to get over it is kind of like telling someone with diabetes to get over their resistance to insulin. It doesn't quite work that way. So what actually is depression? So whilst everyone with depression will experience it a bit differently, there are a cluster of symptoms that generally stay pretty consistent. Broadly speaking, people with depression often describe it as if they're seeing the world through a blackened lens, or that there's this dark cloud hanging over them wherever they go. In this state, normal day-to-day tasks such as getting out of bed, brushing their teeth, eating a meal, driving to work, just seem like the most challenging and arduous missions. They find no joy, pleasure, or fulfillment in anything that they do, They have no energy, motivation, or desire to do anything, and life can start to feel empty and meaningless. J.K. Rowling actually created Dementors in Harry Potter as a metaphor for depression, which is actually a very powerful and accurate comparison. And as grim as it sounds, depression is a disease that essentially sucks the life out of you and feeds off your happiness and leaves you feeling empty and lifeless and often very alone. So let's look at the symptoms associated with depression. So firstly, there's depressed mood, and there's some variability with this in that some people will report feeling really intense sadness, whereas other people describe just feeling nothing. They essentially become devoid of all emotion and report feeling very empty and numb and lifeless and just nothing. Next, there's what we call anhedonia, which is an inability to feel pleasure. So all of the things that used to give someone joy, whether it be exercising or socializing or playing music or their careers no longer gives that person any pleasure or enjoyment. Next, individuals with depression very commonly report a loss of energy and fatigue. And in addition, we often see what's referred to as psychomotor retardation, which is the slowing down of thought and movement as if someone had turned down a dial and put them on slow speed. Concentration difficulties are very common in people with depression. Feeling an overwhelming sense of hopelessness and worthlessness is very common in people with depression. And these individuals are also more susceptible to developing thoughts of suicide or self-harm. So in addition to all of those symptoms, depression is also associated with a cluster of what we call vegetative symptoms, which relate to bodily processes which are essential for life. Now, this is where we'll start to explore how depression is not just an all-in-your-head kind of thing. There's a huge biological basis. And the physiology of people with major depression looks very different to the physiology of people without this condition. So firstly, in terms of vegetative symptoms, depression is very commonly associated with appetite disturbances. People with depression will very commonly report a loss of appetite, a loss of enjoyment for food, and just no desire to eat anything at all. And commonly what they do eat will be very low quality nutrition. So sugary and fatty processed kinds of foods to make themselves feel better and to give them an energy boost. And I'm sure we can all relate to that. If you think back to a time when you were feeling particularly down and deflated about something, you probably weren't motivated to go to the store, get an assortment of organic vegetables and saute them up with some quinoa and grilled fish for dinner. And whilst a lot of people with depression report a reduced appetite, many people with depression also report the opposite. So a tendency to overeat and consume more when they're feeling particularly depressed. So it can really go both ways in regards to appetite disturbances. Secondly, sleep disturbances are very common in people with depression. And similar to appetite disturbances, this can go both ways. In that some people find it extremely hard to fall asleep and may wake up constantly through the night, which we refer to as insomnia. Insomnia. 
where some people sleep too much, which we refer to as hypersomnia. And when we sleep, we go through various different stages of sleep throughout what we call sleep cycles, which follow a very set structure. But in individuals with depression, this structure is completely out of whack and disorganized. So in addition to these individuals sleeping too little or too much, the structure of their sleep is disordered as well. So something that many people may not be aware of is that individuals with depression are in a chronic state of internal stress. And we can see this through increased cortisol levels, which is commonly referred to as the stress hormone, and overactivity of the HPA axis, which mediates the body's stress response, otherwise known as the fight or flight response. They are in a constant state of stress. They're fighting this huge internal battle and they're helpless in that it's like they've been thrown into World War II with nothing but a wooden spoon to defend themselves with. So in a previous video, I described this stress response where when we perceive some sort of threat, this triggers a cascade of physiological and hormonal responses, such as increased heart rate, increased breathing rate, adrenaline release, etc. Now, it's very common for individuals with depression to get caught in this negative thinking cycle, where they engage in negative self-talk, ruminate about things that have gone wrong in the past, beat themselves up over perceived failures, and have pessimistic thoughts about the future. And because the brain is very bad at differentiating between perceived threats and actual threats, when these individuals are constantly telling themselves that they're a failure and that things won't get better, this will trigger the exact same stress response as if they're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, though obviously the magnitude of the response will be different. And because these negative thoughts are relentless in people experiencing depression, they end up in this constant state of stress 24-7, which they have very little control over. Now, this is where the theory of learnt helplessness comes in when it comes to explaining depression, which suggests that when someone is repeatedly exposed to stress, they learn to believe that they can't control or change the situation, and eventually they stop trying and give up. So this concept was kind of accidentally discovered by Martin Seglerman and his colleagues in 1965, where they were doing some research on classical conditioning with dogs. So most people will be familiar with Pavlov's classical conditioning, which is the whole, you ring a bell and give a dog food, the dog learns to associate the bell with the food and then starts to salivate when you ring the bell, even though there's no food. So Seglerman conducted a follow-up experiment where he would ring a bell and then immediately give a dog an electric shock. And this was clearly before ethics was really a thing. And as predicted, after a number of pairings, eventually the dog reacted to the bell as if it had already been shocked. But then something kind of interesting happened. So Seglerman then put a bunch of dogs who had learned to associate the bell with the shock in a large crate, which was divided down the middle with a low fence that the dogs could easily jump over. One side of the crate was electrified and the other wasn't. So when Seglerman put the dogs in the electrified side of the crate and administered a shock, he expected the dogs to just jump over to the other side of the crate, which wasn't electrified. But that's not what he found. The dogs just lay there in defeat. They gave up. They had learned that there was nothing that they could do to control the shock in the first part of the experiment, so they just gave up. They admitted defeat and they had learnt to be helpless. And this is essentially what depression is. Your body is in a constant state of stress all of the time. You're fighting this internal stress battle and you have absolutely no control over it. And as I mentioned, it's like you're thrown in World War II with nothing but a wooden spoon to fight back with. You learn to be helpless and hopeless. And the lack of control over what's happening internally starts to generalize, so you feel as though you have no control and are just completely helpless in all aspects of your life. As I mentioned, it's so much more than just being sad. So we've gone through a lot of evidence so far, which makes it pretty clear that there's a biological basis for depression. It's not an all-in-your-head kind of thing. We know that the physiology of people with depression is different compared to people without this condition, particularly with relation to their sleep and this chronic stress response. But there is so much more which screams biology, which is why telling someone to get over their depression and to stop being sad is about as useful as a hammer made out of glass. So let's look at some more evidence regarding this biological basis. So firstly, there's hormones. So we know that hormones related to stress such as cortisol are usually elevated in people with major depression. We also know that women are far more susceptible to developing depression at particular times, such as after giving birth, when they're on their period, and also when they go through menopause. 
And this is because they're experiencing significant hormonal changes during this time, which can trigger the onset of depression or exacerbate pre-existing depression. Secondly, there's the neurochemistry. So we know that there are many neurotransmitters associated with depression, which are basically chemical messengers in the brain that allow neurons to talk to each other and communicate. And there are three neurotransmitters in particular, which have been shown to be significantly affected in depression, including norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin. And these have formed the basis for many antidepressant medications, especially serotonin in SSRIs. So to quickly elaborate on that in a very overly simplistic way, it's much more complicated than this. An absence of norepinephrine is primarily associated with the psychomotor retardation that we see in major depression. An absence of dopamine is linked to anhedonia, so that loss of pleasure in previously enjoyed activities. And an absence of serotonin is associated with low mood and a sense of grief. And the final piece of evidence that this is very much a biological condition is that there's a very strong genetic component to depression. If your mom or dad or brother or sister or uncle has depression, you are much more likely to develop it yourself. And if one identical twin has major depression, there is a 50% chance that the other twin will have it as well. Now, most of us are familiar with the whole nature-nurture debate, and depression is definitely both. But it's undeniable there's this strong genetic component, which again points towards a biological underpinning to depression. So that brings me to the end of this video. Hopefully you've learned a thing or two about depression, what it is, how it works, how it's much more than just being sad, and how it's definitely not something that's all in your head. And hopefully we can continue to increase knowledge and awareness regarding this condition so that it's handled with a bit more sensitivity, we'll be better equipped to support people who are going through it, and so that the stigma surrounding it and mental health in general can continue to subside.